Welcome, everybody, to another episode of SETI Live, brought to you from the SETI Institute here on the West Coast, and uh, an opportunity for you to hear some of the most prominent people in the world of science and to ask them questions. You can grill them like a mess of onions on the barbie. So we're going to get started. Let me introduce my guest today. It's Professor Michio Kaku, who is a professor of theoretical physics at CCNY, City College of New York, a great school and a very well-known guy. Uh, professor Kaku has written, I think, an Avogadro's number of books, many, many books. Uh, I'm sure he's not someone that requires very elaborate uh, introduction. So we're going to start right away. Uh, can I call you Mishu? Is that all right? Sure, fine. Okay. Well, here you are. Listen, your latest book is called The God Equation. And uh, of course, one might naively wonder, is that an equation for God or is that an equation by God? Maybe you should tell us a little bit about what the title means. Well, I first heard of the title when I was eight years old. When I was eight years old, a great scientist had just died and all the newspapers put a picture of his desk on the front page with a book, just a book on his desk that was opened. And the caption said, the greatest scientist of our time could not finish this book. So I said to myself, wow, <laughs> come on, give me a break. Why couldn't he ask his mother? It's a homework assignment. Why didn't he go to the library? What is so hard that the greatest scientists of our time couldn't finish that book? Well, I had to know. So I went to the library and I found out that book. But that book was written by Albert Einstein. And that book was to contain the God equation, an equation no more than one inch long, perhaps, that would allow us to, quote, read the mind of God. So I said to myself, wow, that's for me. So and when I was in high school, I went to my mom and I said, mom, can I have permission to build a particle accelerator in the garage? A 2.3 million electron volt beta tronic electron accelerator in the garage. And my mom said, sure, why not? And don't forget to take out the garbage. Well, I went to Westinghouse. I got 400 pounds of transformer steel. 22 miles of copper wire, and I built a six kilowatt Betatron particle accelerator in the garage. Every time I plugged it in, it consumed every ounce of energy in the house. I would blow out all the fuses. Every time the fuses went out, my poor mom would say, why couldn't I have a son who plays basketball? Maybe if I buy him a baseball. And for God's sake, why can't he find a nice Japanese girlfriend? Why does he have to build these machines in the garage? Well, that's when I first heard about this God equation. So I went to the National Science Fair. I won grand prize there with my work. I also work on antimatter as well. And I met a scientist there. I met a nuclear scientist who helped to build the atomic bomb. His name was Edward Teller. And he sort of took me under his wing. He arranged for me to get a scholarship to Harvard. And that became my entry, my passport into the God equation. And of course, when I graduated from Harvard, he offered me a job. Ed Edward Teller said I could work at Los Alamos, National Laboratories, Livermore, but what would I do? I would design hydrogen warheads. Well, I respectfully declined that very generous offer because I wanted to work on something bigger better, even more powerful than a hydrogen bomb. I wanted to work on the God equation. That is the creation of the universe. Oh. The equation that set the universe into motion. Okay, well, Michio, I mean, that's a fantastic, I mean, it's a good thing that you didn't tell your mom you were going to try to replicate the Large Hadron Collider in the garage. You would have needed a much bigger garage, but that's certainly impressive. <laughs> you build an accelerator at age eight, ten, whatever. But the God equation is then an a, a an, an equation. It's one equation that encapsulates all of physics. I mean, physics has lots of equations. You know, the Schrodinger equation, the Boltzmann equation, Newton's laws, James Clerk Maxwell's law. All these equations 
And what are you going to do? You're going to say they all come from this one equation? That's right. All of biology can be re-expressed in the language of chemistry. All of chemistry, in turn, can be expressed in the language of physics. All of physics, in turn, can be expressed in terms of two theories. The theory of the very big, that is relativity, black holes, big bangs, and the theory of the very small, that is the quantum theory. The only trouble, the trouble is these two theories hate each other. The theory of the big is based on smooth surfaces, Einstein's theory, but the theory of the small is based on chopped up quantum particles, which is the opposite of this smooth picture given to us by Einstein. But now we have a way to unify these two pictures. The way to unify these two pictures is through music, the music of vibrating strings, tiny little strings that can vibrate. Each vibration corresponds to a note, a subatomic particle. So what is physics? Physics is the harmonies you can create on these tiny vibrating strings, each vibration being a subatomic particle. What is chemistry? Chemistry is the melodies you can play on these vibrating strings. What is the universe? The universe is a symphony of strings. And then what is the mind of God? The mind of God would be cosmic music resonating through 11 dimensional hyperspace. That would be the mind of God. Okay. So there's going to be one equation that reconciles. Well, I mean, physics is, as you say, a, a problem of East is East and West is West. And they just don't seem to meet. They don't meet in the middle that you have quantum mechanics on the one hand and you have relativity on the other hand. And, you know, you go to some particles or situations that are sort of in between those two realms and they don't seem to mesh well. But you said that Einstein had been working on this theory of everything. I don't know if that's... a a germane term for this, but he had been working on it and he didn't do it. He couldn't figure it out. There are plenty of people out there working on this. None of them has figured it out. Is it going to be figured out? Is this something that, you know, will only be understood 500 years from now? No. First of all, all of string theory can be summarized in one equation. That's my equation. I'm the creator of string field theory. However, let's be honest, that is not the final theory. We now realize that there are membranes as well. Membranes like a beach ball or a bubble. In fact, our universe is probably a membrane of some sort, a bubble that is expanding, and that's called the Big Bang Theory. But we do know that string theory can be summarized in one equation. That's my equation, string field theory, which I created with my co-author, Keiji Kakawa. But that's not the final story. The final story is we want a theory of strings and membranes. That would give us a theory, one equation, that would summarize all known physical laws. Every single law you can think of can eventually be reduced down to physics. We think that all of physics in turn can be reduced down to the field theory of these extended objects, strings and membranes. But what about the people, and there are some there in New York where you are, who like to write that, well, string theory has supported a lot of physicists because they get uh, grants to do it, but it's maybe just an elaborate mathematical game that doesn't actually have any physical reality. What do you say to that point of view to say, you know, that idea doesn't have much reality or, or how, how committed are you to the strings, uh, the string idea? Well, as Carl Sagan once said, remarkable claims require remarkable proof. And in the book, I mentioned five five experimental tests that you can use to show that it's a theory of everything or a theory of nothing. First of all, just a few weeks ago outside Chicago at the at Fermilab, they discovered a crack, a crack in the standard model of subatomic particles. This has created an enormous sensation. This crack could be the beginning of string theory as an experimental science. We're not sure about this, but we do know that the standard model, which does describe particles, is the ugliest theory known to science. It has 36 quarks and antiquarks, 20 free parameters that you can play with at will, three identical generations, redundant generations of particles. It's a theory so ugly that only a mother can love it. Well, but hey, it works. It works. What can you say? At the low level region, it works. But at the high level, 
at the high level regime, that's when we expect a new force to emerge, a fifth force, a force that we've never seen before. And that force could be the force of string theory. So that's one way to prove the theory, to find out about what's happening with this new result from Fermi Laboratory. Second, the European Space Agency is going to launch LISA into orbit. And it's a, it's a gravity wave detector that'll give us baby pictures of the instant of creation. Not 300,000 years after the Big Bang, but the instant of creation. And maybe, just maybe, we'll have evidence of the, of the baby universe emerging from the womb. And then an umbilical cord. Perhaps an umbilical cord connecting our universe to a parent universe. Because string theory is a theory of the multiverse, that we live in a bubble bath of universes, only one of which is our universe. And then dark matter. Dark matter, we know, fills the galaxy, holds the, holds the galaxy together. And we have a candidate for dark matter, which is the Fotino. It is, has no charge, has gravity, and has all the properties of dark matter, which we hope to capture in the laboratory in the coming years. There are many groups right now experimenting, trying to find proof of dark matter, which could be the Fotino, that is the next vibration, the next octave of the string. And then I should also mention that the Japanese, the Chinese, and the Europeans are already submitting proposals for the post-Large Hadron Collider era. That is a machine that may be powerful enough to detect the presence of string theory. So anyway, there are five different proofs, ex tests that I mentioned in the, the book as to how you can test this theory, because all great theories can be tested. Well, it's, uh, otherwise it's not of terribly great interest. So let, let, let me sort of summarize what you've said so far. String theory may indeed be the path to the a God equation, that, uh, that one equation that describes everything. But these strings, for those who don't know, these are postulated little vibrating entities that you know, make, th make up things like electrons and neutrons and protons and you know, your lunch. So uh, that, that's kind of the idea. But because they're so small, we can't just observe them directly. You can't just turn on an electron microscope somewhere and see them. I mean, you can, you can sort of see atoms these days, but you can't see strings. They're, they're, they're much, much smaller. Is there any, I mean, you've mentioned that there are five tests for string theory. Without getting into string theory, why do you think that it is the path to the, the God equation? Well, we're not positive, but realize that uh, hundreds of proposals have been made for the God equation over the last several decades. Each time, these proposals have been shot down because there's something wrong with them. A theory of everything has to satisfy three criteria. Three criteria. First, it has to contain all of Einstein's general relativity. Second, it has to include the standard model with these hundreds of subatomic particles all fitting into place. Third, it has to be mathematically sufficient, mathematically consistent. So I tell my students and people that I meet, if you ever find the God equation, an equation that satisfies these three criteria, then what should you do? You should tell me first. And we'll publish together and we'll win the Nobel Prize together because that's all it takes. An equation that summarizes three basic ideas, general relativity, the standard model, and it has to be free of anomalies and divergences. That's it, folks. And you will, get, you will go down in history as the next Einstein. Well. Michio, throughout this discussion, we have assumed that the, the God equation that encompasses all the other equations of physics is something relatively simple, or at least can be expressed as something relatively simple. You say maybe one inch long equation, depends on your handwriting, I suppose. But, you know, th there's sort of something implicit in this, these statements to the effect that nature should be beautiful is a term that sometimes used. It should be elegant, that it doesn't require an equation with 500 uh, different you know, parameters in it or whatever. It's got to be something simple. Why is that? Why, why should our universe be simple? Well, you know, Einstein grappled with that question and realized that the universe could have been random. It could have been chaotic. It could have been devoid of life. 
It could have been just a bunch of meaningless subatomic particles, but here we are in this gorgeous universe. So Einstein believed in the God of Spinoza, that the universe wasn't totally an accident, that it's based on elegance, beauty, simplicity. Believe it or not, all the equations that we know of can be summarized in one sheet of paper. One sheet of paper has Einstein's theory and this horrible theory called the Standard Model, but there it is. One sheet of paper that summarizes all the known laws of physics. And of course, these two theories hate each other, but on one sheet of paper, you can write it down. It didn't have to be that way. In other words, the universe gets simpler and simpler the more we dig into the theory. And what is beauty anyway? Beauty to a physicist is symmetry. That is, if I take an equation and I rotate it, it remains the same, just like a sphere or an ice crystal or a snowflake. It remains the same when you rotate it. Who has the largest symmetry known to science? String theory. String theory has a symmetry called supersymmetry, which takes the entire universe, rotates it into itself. That is gorgeous. That is absolutely stunning. The fact that you could write on a sheet of paper an equation one inch long that has all the symmetries of the known universe. My equation, by the way, is an inch and a half, inch and a half long. We hope to add membranes to it and get it down to one inch. That's the goal. The beauty of physics. Maybe that ought to be the next. next. I think it's true in biology too, actually, when you look at the cover of Vogue magazine or whatever, you know, these people have highly symmetric faces. There's, there's something in symmetry, I guess. All right. So this may happen. You know, since we are kind of speaking of philosophy here, a question that I have on this idea that there may be a God equation or whatever, that to begin with, if I were entering a school to study physics, you know, I wouldn't have to memorize all those things from Newton or whatever, and Jim Maxwell. If I just had the God equation, could I just derive everything else? Or probably not at the freshman level, but... One of the uh, absolutely astounding features of string theory is that if Einstein had never been born, if Einstein had never been born, we would have discovered general relativity as nothing but the lowest octave of the string. This is stunning. This is what captures the imagination of every young physicist who learns about string theory. Gravity is for free. Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is gorgeous but rather complicated, just is spit right out of string theory as the lowest octave. The lowest octave of a vibrating string gives you all of Einstein's theory. Now that to me is stunning. So I'd like to think that in my sector of the galaxy, when I write down an equation for string theory, I like to think that on the other side of the galaxy, there's a young alien writing the same identical equation in a different notation stumbling upon the same laws of physics that we are studying here in this sector of the Milky Way galaxy. Now, of course, if you're an authority on Shakespeare or Hemingway, yes, you can write all sorts of beautiful things about Shakespeare, but who can listen to you? Aliens in outer space may haven't a clue as to who Shakespeare was, but you show them the theory of everything and they'll say, aha, yes, that's it. That is the God equation. All right the other side of the galaxy, the other side of the universe, for that matter. I, I think we have good experimental evidence that the universe has the same physics everywhere. So if you find this, you, know, you may be the first one in our galaxy to find it, but presumably it's been found by others. It, it, that actually begs the question, suppose there are such things as, you know, parallel universes, and they may have their own physics. Is there likely to be a, if you will, uh, God, God equation, I mean, that, that describes all these other possible universes, not just ours? Well, that's the multiverse idea. First of all, Einstein says that our universe is a bubble of some sort. It's expanding, and that's called the Big Bang Theory. String theory says that if you quantize it, then, then the universe can exist in parallel states, quantum states, and therefore we have a bubble bath. And when these two bubbles collide, or they fission in half, that's the Big Bang. So the Big Bang is nothing but the changing of these bubbles as they bump into each other and split off. And then the question is, do all these bubbles have the same law of physics? 
Well, we have to really think about that question very carefully. Stephen Hawking looked at that question. Stephen Hawking gave it a name. He called it the space-time foam. The space-time foam is the foam of, the, of all these bubbles that create the vacuum of outer space. These bubbles are very tiny. For the most part, they pop into existence and pop right back into the vacuum. But one day, one day, one of these microscopic bubbles said no. I'm not going to pop back into the vacuum. I'm going to keep on going and going and going. And that's our universe. Our universe is probably the black sheep, the bubble that just kept on expanding and didn't want to jump back into the vacuum. But could there be different laws of physics in other bubbles? In that case, then, then string theory would become a metaphysics. That is a physics beyond physics would be string theory. Each of these bubbles would obey one vacuum of string theory, but the totality of the multiverse would be metaphysics, and that is string theory. Okay, so, so it's a, not at all a parochial quest. Uh, it's not just our universe. It could apply to these other parallel universes. That's right. It, it could also be the salvation of everything we know and love. The second law of thermodynamics is a death warrant. Because the laws of physics say that eventually everything must freeze over if we are in a closed system. The galaxies will wither away, die out, we'll have an ocean of black holes and neutron stars. Because in a closed system, it goes to a situation of maximum entropy, that is infinite coldness and darkness. But there's a loophole. There's only one and only one way for life to survive the laws of physics. And that is to go beyond the laws of physics, to go through a wormhole to another universe where the laws of physics are a little bit different. Things are warmer in that other universe. So perhaps in the future, we'll use string theory to leave our universe and go to a neighboring universe where it's warmer. And then we can start all over again, messing up that universe as well. We'll have two universes to mess up. Well, that's certainly an enticing prospect. I mean, so what you're saying is that it's conceivable that such things as wormholes, Einstein, Rosen bridges, whatever you want to call them, that there are maybe pathways from our universe to some other universe. And I mean, if you talk to physicists about this, they're, they don't seem to be 100% on board with that. They say, well, maybe you can't actually go through a wormhole or whatever. Um, do we know whether that possibility could even exist? That the answer to that lies in string theory. That is, when you go through a wormhole, quantum corrections may build up and kill you as you go through the wormhole. In fact, even on Star Trek, they say the main problem with going through a wormhole is stability, which is true, quantum stability. Only string theory has the ability to calculate the quantum stability of a wormhole. Now, Stephen Hawking looked at this question very carefully. Stephen Hawking's conclusion was that yes, it's probably possible to go through a wormhole. Now, to go through a wormhole to the past, he had doubts about a time machine, but a wormhole that could take you faster than the speed of light, he said, ultimately, yes, it may be possible. But like I said, string theory is the only theory that can allow you to calculate the quantum corrections and calculate the stability of the wormhole. And by the way, I personally think that Hawking's calculation of the time machine is maybe incorrect. He assumed that if you go through a time machine, you would go through an infinite number of times, quantum corrections would build up and the machine would explode. But you see, I personally believe that if you go backwards in time, the river of time splits, splits in half. It doesn't circulate an infinite number of times, giving you infinite Feynman diagrams and infinite uh, collapse is basically a one-pass situation, in which case, yes, a time machine may also be possible as well. Well, we're going to get to some of the questions from the viewers. I was going to say listeners. They're probably listening as well. But, you know, Misha, just kind of a, almost a personal question. But, you know, when you're riding the 7th Avenue subway or whatever to work, and the guy next to you asks you what you do, and you say, well, I'm a physicist, or whatever you say, and they want you to describe briefly, you know, in the time it takes get, to get to the next station, what it is that you're trying to do. What, what are the big questions 
that occupy your time when you're sitting at your desks there? Well, we know the theory of the Big Bang, that there was an explosion. We don't know why it banged. We don't know how it banged. Uh, we don't know to what purpose it banged. Can it bang again? All we know is it banged. That's called the Big Bang Theory. And so what I do for a living is to try to find out why it banged, how it banged, can it bang again? What was the engine that drove the Big Bang? Like I said, I did not want to work on hydrogen warheads. Hydrogen warheads, I thought, were an engineering question. The basic laws of physics were known. But the late basic laws of physics at the Big Bang is called the Planck energy. That's my home. I, all my papers that I publish are in the Planck energy, which is a quadrillion times greater than the energy of the Large Hadron Collider. We're talking about 10 to the 19 billion electron volts. That is the energy of creation, the energy of Genesis. And so what do I do for a living? I try to find out why it banged. Yeah. Well, you could have gone to work for Teller. I mean, you know, those H-bombs also go bang, but that's a different thing. <laughs> let's let's uh, look at some of the questions that the people who are on the other end of this call have sent in. Uh, here's a, oh, Ernesto. I, I want to acknowledge Ernesto because he made a donation to the SETI Institute during this discussion. And I, I just tell everybody else, the SETI Institute, of course, is a nonprofit. And we present this and other events uh, at our own expense, which is to say, I hope, at your expense. So if you uh, find these interesting, please go to the SETI Institute website. It's just SETI.org. And uh, you can find there how you can, can help us out financially. Let, let, let me go to some of these questions here, Michelle. Uh, <laughs> okay, I, I don't even understand the questions, let alone the answers. Um, how does quantum entanglement factor into the God equation? Well, the, the God equation is a quantum equation. That is, it doesn't give you a definite calculation of what happens when two balls collide. It tells you the probability the probability of what happens when two balls collide. It is a quantum theory. And instead of balls colliding, we're now talking about universes. When universes collide, universes can exist in parallel states. These are parallel universes, which by necessity are, are part of string theory because string theory is based on probabilities of parallel universes rather than individual universes. And then the question is, what about time, quantum entanglement? Quantum entanglement occurs when I have two electrons, I bring them together and they vibrate in unison, and then I separate them. Even if you separate them by a galaxy, you tweak one and the other then senses the fact that its partner has been tweaked. Now replace these electrons with universes. Here I have two universes in synchronization. And if I separate them, then yes, they are entangled, even if they're separated in 11 dimensional hyperspace, they are still entangled by the quantum theory. So what happens in one universe affects the other. Now, how fast does this effect take place? Infinitely fast. That's why Einstein hated this idea of entanglement. But I'll be honest, Einstein has the last laugh because it's only useless information that travels faster than the speed of light. So Einstein must be chuckling right now, realizing that yes, he was wrong. Information can go faster than the speed of light by quantum entanglement, but it is useless information. Morse code cannot be sent by quantum entanglement. Now, then the question is, if Elvis Presley is still alive in one universe, and in the other universe, Elvis Presley dies, and then does that mean that Elvis Presley is still alive in one universe? And the answer is yes that you might be able to be entangled with another universe in which you're dead. Now, of course, this leads to all sorts of philosophical questions, but hey, that's where all the fun begins. Okay, I, you know, I think it's worthwhile maybe to clarify uh, this idea that quantum entanglement is a channel for instantaneous communication. You know, I sometimes get emails from people who say, well, you guys are looking for the aliens by, you know, looking for flashing lasers or radio waves or stuff like that. But that all goes at the speed of light. And who's going to be interested in having a conversation with you if they're a thousand light years away or something like that? It takes too long. Why aren't you using quantum entanglement 
to search for the aliens. What would you say to that? Because um, let's say that I have a green sock and a red sock, and I put one sock on one foot, the other sock on the other foot. If I raise one sock and it's red, what is the color of the other sock? Well, it's green because I have a red sock and a green sock. Well, let's say one day you reveal one, one sock and it is red. How fast did you know the other sock was green? Infinitely fast. Now separate the two socks by a galaxy. A galaxy now separates these two socks. When you unveil one sock and it's red, what is the color of the other sock on the other side of the galaxy? It is green. Now, does that mean you can send Morse code this way? No, you cannot send Morse code. Think about it. If I have a green sock and a red sock, can you send did it did it did it did it? Can you send Morse code this way? No, you cannot. So sorry about that. It is instantaneous transmission of useless knowledge. So, like I said, Einstein must be laughing, laughing in his grave right now, realizing that yes, it is possible to go faster than the speed of light. Einstein was wrong about that but it's not useful. Therefore, why bother to talk about it? Now, the only way to break the light barrier is with a wormhole. That does conform, we think, to Einstein's theory of general relativity, and then you can go faster than the speed of light, but there's a catch there. There's always a catch. The catch is that you need the energy of a black hole. You need the Planck energy, 10 to the 19 billion electron volts. That is a quadrillion times more powerful than the Large Hadron Collider. So in other words, you would have to be perhaps a type three civilization, a galactic civilization to harness the Planck energy. We are a type zero civilization. We get our energy from dead plants, oil and coal. We don't roam the galactic space lanes, but if we did roam the galactic space lanes as a type three civilization, then yeah, it may be possible. All right. So spooky action at a distance, but not communication at a distance, at least not yep. faster than the speed of light. All right. Let's go to another question here. Um, could string theory help answer why is there something rather than nothing? And that, that is a kind of profound question. Well, first of all, let's talk about our universe. What is the net charge of our universe? Positive charges cancel negative charges exactly. The net charge of the universe is zero. Now, what is the net spin of the universe? Galaxies spin in all directions. What do they average out to? Zero. So what is the net spin of the universe? Zero. What is the net energy of the universe? Well, gravity has negative energy, matter has positive energy, the two cancel, and what do you get? Zero. Our universe has the quantum numbers of nothing. Our universe has zero net charge, zero net matter energy, and zero net spin. What does that mean? That means our universe is probably a quantum transition from nothing. Like I said, the space-time foam that Stephen Hawking talked about means that in a vacuum, bubbles are constantly being created out of nothingness, and they constantly go back into nothingness, so we don't see them because they're too tiny. But one day, one of these bubbles said, nope, I'm just going to keep on going, and that created our universe. So our universe probably came from nothing. Some religious books talk about the universe came from the mist. Well, yeah, the quantum mist, that's where the universe came from. And how did it happen? It happened either because of a collision of these bubbles in the mist or a fissioning of a bubble in the mist. That is probably where the Big Bang came from. All right, so it's the it really is the ultimate free lunch, right? I mean, you get a whole universe, but it doesn't cost you anything. That's right. The net spin, charge, and energy of the universe is zero. <clears throat> What's a certain perspective of my plans for the evening? Let's see. Uh, um, here's one that you hear frequently. I, I'll read this to you. What is the possibility that the universe is a hologram projected on, well, projected on something, but that it's a hologram. I'm not quite sure what the advantage of being a hologram might be. But. Well, that is the holographic universe idea, which actually comes from string theory. It turns out that recently there was a stunning mathematical breakthrough in string theory showing that if you exist in, let's say, n dimensions, then all your information can be encoded in an n plus one dimension. Now think of a hologram. A hologram is what? A two-dimensional film, 
that's all a hologram is. But when you shoot lasers through it, it recreates the original three-dimensional image encoded in this two-dimensional sheet. So a hologram is a three-dimensional encoding on a two-dimensional frame. Okay, one dimension is thrown away. You don't need it because all the all the information is on a smaller dimension. So it turns out that in string theory, a five dimensional universe encodes a 10 dimensional universe. This has blown the minds away of most physicists. We used to think that we live in four dimensions, but it turns out that a five dimensional universe is dual to a 10 dimensional universe. So in some sense, yeah, we are holograms that we exist not realizing that we have an image, an image of ourselves moving in 10 dimensional hyperspace. Now again, string theory is not confirmed, but string theory is the first mathematical realization of a holographic universe. All right, let's take one more question here, Misha. Um, yeah, some of these are very informed questions. Well, this one, this one is maybe uh, worth asking here. Can Michio explain how string theorists came up with the idea that there were more than four dimensions? And what, what might some of them be like? I don't know. You, you might be living in them now, so you know what they'd be like. But why is it that you always hear that, well, string theory, you need 10 dimensions, you need 11 dimensions. It's, you know, why the extra dimensions? Well, you see, we physicists, first of all, we take a classical theory like a Newtonian theory. We take a Newtonian theory and then we quantize it. And we assume that all the beautiful properties of the Newtonian theory, the symmetries, carry over to the quantum theory. That's been the mantra for the last 100 years, except in string theory. If I take string theory and I start in four dimensions and I quantize it, I get anomalies. I get things that destroy the original symmetry of the string, except these, these anomalies are proportional to D minus 11. Now, D minus 11 is a factor where D is the dimension of space-time, and 11 is just a number. It turns out that these anomalies are proportional to D minus 10 and D minus 11. So if the universe is 10-dimensional or 11-dimensional, boom! All the infinities are zero. Now, this blew the minds of physicists because we always believe that when you quantize a theory, it works in any dimension. Einstein's theory works in any dimension, five, six, seven, a million, whatever dimension you want. Einstein's theory exists, but not string theory. String theory is the only theory known to science that selects out its own dimensionality. Now, of course, when this was first discovered, it created a lot of laughter in the physics community. Uh, John Schwartz, a guy at Caltech, uh, was in the, in, the in the elevator once. Richard Feynman walks in the elevator and he says, hey, John, how many dimensions are you in today? So we became the laughing stock of the physics community. Well, people are not laughing anymore because we now realize that, well, yeah, maybe we do exist in a higher dimension. You see, in four dimensions, there's not enough room to fit the electromagnetic force, gravity, and the nuclear forces. It's like trying to get a jigsaw puzzle and the puzzle pieces don't fit. But if you go to 10 dimensions or 11 dimensions, all these jigsaw puzzles fit exactly on top of each other. So we now realize that four dimensions is too small too small to fit all the known laws of physics. In higher dimensions, there's more room, more room to fit these laws of physics on top of each other so that these equations, like two jigsaw puzzle pieces, fit together very nicely. And so, yes, this is pure mathematics, but wow, what mathematics? We've never seen anything like this before. In other words, we were not meant to see this theory in this century. We discovered this theory by accident. Two postdocs were flipping through a math book from the 1800s and stumbled upon this equation. So we realized that we were not supposed to see this equation. This equation is smarter than we are. We're constantly discovering new mathematical features. If you were a young mathematician and you want to win the Fields Medal, the Nobel Prize of Mathematics, what are you going to do? Learn string theory. Realize that many of the Fields Medalists get their inspiration from quantum field theory and string theory. So this is 
we're just gawking at this theory. We were not supposed to see this theory in this century. In fact, I'm privileged to be alive to see this theory. Yeah, sounds like a frequent science fiction theme. There are some it things does. man was not meant to know. I'll just end with that, actually, uh, Michelle. And that is, you know, we have these little uh, two pound, three pound, I guess they're three pound, three pound brains, just three pounds of squishy stuff. Is that enough to actually find and understand the God equation? Or is that going to be beyond us until we evolve 10 pound brains or some other method of thinking about things? Well, back in the 1960s, the strong nuclear force was so complicated that we used to say that you cannot teach calculus to a dog and you cannot crack the strong interactions because the human brain is not powerful enough to crack the strong interactions, nuclear force. Well, we cracked it. And how did we crack it? In, in part, string theory. String theory allows you to show that strings glue the quarks together to form hadrons. And that's why we have what is called quantum chromodynamics. So string theory helped us to understand the strong nuclear force. Now we realize that we can do a lot more than just a strong nuclear force. We can get the whole shooting match, everything out of string theory. And so we now begin to realize that yes, maybe the human brain is capable of understanding everything. Realize that the most complex object in the entire universe is sitting on your shoulders right now. Isn't that stunning? Either the universe is very stupid or else, hey, we're, we're pretty smart. But the smartest object, most complex object in the known universe is sitting on our shoulders right now. I, I hope that no aliens who might be tuned in here will be offended by uh, this pat on the back of our heads. <laughs> Professor Michio Kaku, I want to thank you very much for being with us today. I also want to thank the team that makes this possible. They're all behind the scenes, Rebecca McDonald and Beth Johnson and <laughs> Jasmine Hedges. Uh, they actually, you know, push all the right knobs so that we can we can do this. And of course, the SETI Institute. I always want to thank them because they're responsible for really making this possible. That's it for today. Michio Kako, again, thank you so very much for joining us. And uh, thank the rest of you for joining us as well. We'll see you next time.